Okay, um, I think we'll get going. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mirren Lynch. I'm Senior Research Officer here in the ESRI on the Energy Team. And uh, I'm incredibly proud and uh, delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dana Kierkem. Uh, Dana is my first ever PhD student and uh, soon to be PhD graduate. So that's a very, um, uh, a very big occasion for me, as well as for Dana, I know. And uh, she is presenting her PhD thesis research um, on the water energy in excess. Um, and uh, I remember when I started my own PhD, um, my, one of my supervisors said to me that no one ever does the PhD that they set out to do. Everyone always has an idea and they end up doing something different. And uh, I told Dana that story um, the day that she started in the ESRI herself. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, Dana's PhD um, certainly <laughs> lived up to that prediction um, and possibly more so than most, uh, because what we, what we set out to do was quite ambitious. What we wanted to do was we wanted to integrate some of the technical and engineering aspects of wastewater treatment into an energy systems model in order to get a realistic and holistic idea of what the technical characteristics of wastewater treatment actually meant from the energy systems perspective. And as we all know, the decarbonization of energy systems is not an easy task. We need to employ every single tool at our disposal and we need to make sure that we're doing so in a comprehensive manner. And for that reason, um, it would be remiss of me not to mention our co-authors and Dana's co-supervisor, um, Owen Casey in UCD and also Condorelli from uh, UCD as well from the chemical engineering department there. And it really has been a, a team effort, um, but uh, Dana's particular skills and expertise was what brought all of this over the line, I think. So at this point, I'm delighted to hand over to Dana. She's going to talk for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I think, Donna, and uh, we can, um, we're can. we looking forward to some Q&A as well. Um, so uh, feel free to type, type questions in at any point, and particularly if there's something that requires clarification as we go ahead. Otherwise, we will um, get to a comprehensive Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'll hand over to Donna. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Marin, for the lovely introduction. And um, yeah, as you already said, this has been um, a very uh, challenging PhD project, but I think we can be really happy with the results. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this presentation and uh, to all of your uh, questions and discussion afterwards. So the PhD project was um, um, related to the water energy nexus, and we looked particularly at demand response, but also at biogas production from wastewater treatment plants um, in the Irish integrated energy system. So just for um, a little bit of background um, on, on the motivation of this project. So the situation that we're facing in the face of climate change is that we, um, there is a need for decarbonizing our energy systems, right? And um, we all agree that the way to do that is that we need to integrate more um, renewable energy sources um, or the, the generation from renewable energy sources into our electricity systems. But then um, we all know that renewable energy supply is volatile and uh, this volatility um, yeah, uh, requires that um, there is also for the optimal use of these renewable energy resources more flexibility also on the demand side and there's like different approaches or different ideas how um, we can um, yeah, in integrate more flexibility on the demand side um, and um, there are um, different uh, types of consumers where this has been um, already investigated for, particularly for residential consumers, um, but also for industrial consumers. Um, and one interesting sector in that regard, um, in, in our view, was, is the wastewater treatment sector. Um, and this is mainly for two reasons. So first of all, the wastewater treatment uh, sector is uh, wastewater treatment is an electric uh, electricity intensive process so um, sometimes electricity costs in, in certain uh, plants can actually be the second highest cost factor in a conventional wastewater treatment plant um, and uh, second of all the wastewater treatment sector as a um, as a whole can be quite a big electricity consumer um, on, a, on a country level. So in, um, in 
uh, countries with elaborate wastewater treatment, this can account for about 1% of uh, the total electricity consumption of a country um, per year. And on the other hand, so this was the first aspect. And on the other hand, um, there is actually um, quite um, some potential for uh, wastewater treatment plants to, um, to provide flexibility because they are equipped with certain unit processes that allow for flexible um, operation. Um, and what we mean by flexible operation is that we can shift their electricity demand and time without any, um, any detriment to the, um, to the treatment process itself. So the idea is that um, wastewater treatment plants can potentially provide um, so-called demand response to the system, um, but we don't. So we um, we have constraints within this uh, wastewater process um, that potentially limit this flexibility. Um, and on the other hand, we don't yet have um, the sufficient tools to describe these limitations um, properly and then to estimate the potential accurately given these um, constraints. And that is what we set out um, to do in this project. So again, for a bit of uh, background, I wanted to give a brief overview about the, how the wastewater treatment process works in general, and then um, describe a little bit more in, pros in, in, in detail where the flexibility potential lies within this process. So wastewater treatment is generally divided into two steps, which is the primary treatment and the secondary treatment. And in the primary treatment, we have this first uh, screening where the raw sewage comes in. And we have a first like grid chamber and primary clarifier where the first um, yeah, part of the, of the sludge settles and it's already discard, uh, discarded. And then this primary effluent, which comes out of the primary treatment, moves on to a secondary stage of the treatment process where it's kind of arriving in the, in the heart of the process, which is the, um, the aeration process or the biological stage of the treatment. So in this aeration tank that you see there, there's actually a population of microorganisms living in that tank, and they break down the organic material that arrive in the tank. And these uh, microorganisms, they require um, constant supply of air to be able to, to multiply. Um, and this is supplied by an air compressor. So the air compressor um, is actually one of the biggest electricity consumer in the plant. And then finally, um, this effluent also moves on to a secondary, secondary clarifier where the activated sludge from, from the aerated tank settles. Part of that is again disposed of and part of that returns back into the aerated tank to maintain a certain level of, um, of microorganism concentration in the tank. And then in the end, what we sometimes also call tertiary treatment, um, there's some uh, processes of, des of, of disinfect uh, as disinfection, like UV disinfection or chemical disinfection that can also be added to the effluent um, to be finally discharged into, into a water body. So the potentials for flexible uh, operation in, in this whole process now come in like mainly two aspects of the wastewater treatment process itself. And then in the third uh, option um, that is um, as a, at a later stage. So the, yeah, the, one of the biggest potentials lies within the aeration. Um, so the uh, compressor can actually be operated um, in an in, in intermittent fashion or can be turned on and off um, without any detriment to the effluent quality. This has been shown in several case, case studies that the aeration can actually be turned off um, for between 15 and 120 minutes uh, without negative negatives effects on the effluent. Um, then another potential lies in um, in operating the pumping the pumps and um, in an intermittent fashion, so we can also switch on and off the, the pumps in the um, in the plant um, between thirty uh, minutes for inlet pumps and sixty minutes for, for recirculation pumps. And this flexibility in pumping is only possible 
in, conjunct in conjunction with uh, redundancy in, in these big tanks um, that, that you have seen before. So um, there's, there's this um, interplay of, of these two flexibility options there. And finally, um, there is also the option to produce biogas from uh, the, the sludge in the, in the plant. And this flexibility potential arises from, first of all, the biogas storage on site. And then, for example, the biogas can be used to uh, produce electricity on site and therefore so not, this is a category of not only demand flexibility, but also electricity supply flexibility. So from this technical situation, the aim of our study was actually to explore the potential of wastewater treatment plants to provide, to provide flexibility to a power system and particularly to investigate its economic and environmental effects in the Irish context. So we're looking at the power system effects of, um, of potentially providing uh, the flexibility. And we derived two distinct case studies from that. In the first case study that I'm going to present today, um, we determined the effects of, on uh, system costs, on consumer costs, and on the integration of renewable energy sources. And in the second cover, uh, case study, we focused particularly on uncovering the potential interactions between when the plant provides demand response, so demand flexibility, and is also um, has also the capability to produce on-site electricity generation uh, from biogas. So um, we we're particularly interested in that interplay of the two. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight again the novelty of our approach and explain why this was such a challenge in contrast to traditional demand response modeling. Um, so normally, or typically or traditionally, optimization models consist of uh, three parts or three distinct um, categories. One is the objective function where um, we, for example, minimize the, um, the costs on a system level. And this is mostly done. Um, then we have a set of decision variables that uh, the model can um, decide on to, to optimize uh, the, the level of system costs. This can either be depending on the form of the model capacity dispatch and also sometimes investments into, into capacity. Um, and then we have a set of constraints that can either be technical constraints on the system or policy related constraints. Um, and on the supply side, we have um, more flexible thermal power generation um, and a more constrained uh, renewable power generation. And then traditionally on the demand side, we or demand response is often modeled kind of as a black box. And what, what we mean by that is that um, the uh, energy system models abstract from the technical characteristics of the demand response resource and simply just splits the demand in two parts. So one of the parts of that uh, demand is a kind of the non-responsive demand, um, a simple time series, so a list of exogenous uh, parameters that are given to the model. Um, and then the optimization model just needs to satisfy this set demand. So there's no wiggle room in there. Um, and then apart from that, the demand response um, resource is um, yeah, split up as a part of the demand that is modeled as a kind of a virtual storage. So um, this, this storage can, or this, this unit can shift demand in time. Um, and this is only subject to most of the time, basic time constraints. So there's no um, process specific constraints modeled in this. Um, and the novelty of our work it's really that we're taking into account the wastewater treatment specific um, process constraints um, and we explicitly integrate that into the energy system um, model um, as a whole. So um, yeah, we kind of move from this black box approach here to more of a white box approach that I'm going to show on the next slide. So this is our So this is our kind of white box approach that we're using in contrast. Um, 
the um, the energy or the, the power system side is um, depicted in yellow here, where we have a power balance which uh, needs to be satisfied for the whole island of Ireland. We have again this time series um, power demand or power system demand that I just described, which is just a fixed um, time series. And we have the power generation split into thermal and uh, renewable generation. But then in contrast to the traditional way of modeling it, we um, model the um, wastewater treatment process explicitly. And how we do that is also, again, because the wastewater treatment process is quite, as you've seen, is quite complex. Um, and we try to break that down to its essential parts and to simplify the process a little bit. So we have a wastewater inflow, um, again, as a time series that arrives into um, the plant. Um, the plant has the potential to, yeah, so the, the, the wastewater inflow arrives in a storage tank. And here, um, the first flexibility option already comes into play where the model has the potential to withhold the wastewater um, in this first tank, making use of the redundancy in the tank and um, yeah, affecting the operation or in the, in the pump. So the, the pump can be operated here um, flexi in a flexible manner um, in combination with withholding the wastewater in the first tank. Then um, the water is passed via this pump, uh, pump into the second tank, which is the aerated tank that I've also described in the other uh, depiction. And here um, uh, we have broken down the high, highly complex nonlinear um, reactions that are taking place between the microorganisms and the substrate and the, um, and the oxygen concentration. We have broken that down in a linearized reduced order model and um, try to describe the, um, the relations between between the, um, yeah, the, the biochemical components in that tank um, in, within this framework. And the, um, you can see that the blower or the compressor as it was called in the other depiction is here providing, um, is, is um, kind of converting electricity into, um, into air or source electricity and then is providing um, dissolved uh, oxygen to, to the aerated tank. And here the reaction happens within this aerator tank. And then finally, um, the, uh, the effluent is passed on to the water body. And um, so we're taking into account like all the process constraints within the plant in this uh, linear reduced order model. And we're also taking into account uh, the wastewater inflow, which is a distinction to the, to the black, box, black box model. And we're also taking into account hard effluent standards um, before discharging into the water body. So these are the kind, the kind of constraints that limit the, um, the flexibility potential um, that, the, that the plant can provide to the power system. So a bit of um, information on the data that we're using. On the left-hand side, you can see um, the, the, power, the capacity portfolio that we've used for, uh, for this project. All of the data is drawn from, um, from the public um, Plexos data. And um, yeah, you can see that 40, around 40% 40 of the installed capacity is uh, wind capacity. And then around 35% of the installed capacity comes from natural gas. And then there's a quarter of uh, smaller uh, capacity shares. In total, we have a capacity of 14.01 uh, gigawatts, of which 45% um, is um, renewable energy in total. And then on the right-hand side, you can see our time series for the total Ireland all-island demand as well as the wind potential. So this is the capacity factor of wind multiplied with the, with the installed capacity. And um, we have drawn this uh, data for the year 2019 because this was the latest data um, that we had on capacity factors. And the, um, the wind potential is actually drawn from, um, from a data source called Renewables Ninja. 
Okay, and then um, the data on the wastewater treatment plants. Um, this is a public benchmark um, model that we're using for the wastewater treatment plant um, that um, is publicly uh, available. Um, and uh, the size of this model plant is in population equivalents uh, 55,333, um, uh, th uh, 38, sorry. Um, uh, with an average daily flow rate of around 18,400 uh, um, cubic meters per day. And you can see on the right hand side the, um, the um, wastewater influent rate over two weeks. So um, this is the data that's available in um, 15 minutes time steps. We're using one hour time steps in our model. Um, and the unit is in uh, cubic meters per day. And you can see that the variation particularly comes in over the, um, over the weekdays and then in contrast to the weekend where the flow rate is a little bit lower. Our average influent uh, loading um, is uh, 360 grams of biodegradable COD per cubic meter. And the rated tank volume is uh, 6,000 cubic meters. Uh, for the baseline power consumption, we have actually calculated that based on a statistical analysis of the power consumption of 110 uh, German wastewater treatment plants, which is also publicly available. Um, and we um, assumed different power ratings for the blower and the pump, um, depending on the efficiency of the equipment. So we wanted to test for uh, medium efficiency and low efficiency equipment. So that's why we have two values here. So in um, one scenario, the baseline power consumption over the full, uh, over one day is uh, around 6,000 uh, um, K um, kilowatt hours. And um, in the low efficiency case, it's around 9,400 kilowatt hours. Um, and then, so we want, so, so something that was kind of a challenge for us in terms of modeling is how to model the whole Irish, water, uh, Irish wastewater treatment sector because the number of plants with biological treatment that would be comparable to the plant that we're modeling in the whole um, in the whole of Ireland is 449 uh, plants. And this would be very comp computational intensive to, to model all these plants individually. Um, so we came up with the approach to model this whole um, Irish wastewater treatment sector with secondary treatment as only one model plant with the characteristics that I just described. And then we scaled up the electricity consumption of this plant according to the, to the size of the whole wastewater treatment sector. So by this, we kind of assume that the, um, that the um, plants are all similar in, in plant layout, uh, which is kind of a simplifying in assumptions, I would, I would say, but um, on the... Um, um, but potentially this is a good cross-section more or less of like more efficient plants and less efficient plants, we hope. However, regarding the influent profile, um, the daily and weekly profile is of essence. And I would assume that this doesn't change so much um, between plants. So this is kind of more, uh, more or less uh, steady, yeah, at least in dry weather conditions. Um, yes, okay. So in the first case study, um, we looked into the energy system effects of, um, uh, of demand response provision from wastewater treatment plants. And we looked into eight different scenarios where we had like three different um, indicators that we varied. And first of all, we thought um, that we want to look at different, like different degrees of flexibility um, because we have modeled the plant in a way that we can uh, operate the, um, the blower in a flexible manner, but also the pumping in a flexible manner. So in the first set of scenarios, we only um, let the model operate the, uh, the blower flexibly. So the aeration is flexible. And in the second set of scenarios, the aeration and the pumping were flexible. So then the model also 
had the possibility to withhold wastewater. So we called those Q store, which I guess is not really a handy name, uh, not that catchy. Um, and then we also varied the energy efficiency of the uh, of the equipment. So as I already explained in the baseline calculations, we have a medium scenario where the um, where the energy efficiency of the blower and the pump um, is yeah, medium. And then we have one scenario where or one set of scenarios where the energy efficiency of the plant uh, of the blower and the pump is particularly low. So the energy consumption would be higher in, in turn. And finally, the time or the, the seasonal effect might also play a role in the provision of um, flexibility. So we also look at different scenarios um, in terms of the season. And um, we have picked two particularly interesting um, two weeks of, of uh, simulation data in terms of uh, wind potential and uh, and demand and those are two particular weeks in spring and in autumn so in total um, varying these three factors gives us uh, eight scenarios in each combination okay turning to the results um, in general for all the results i just have to highlight that or you have to just keep in mind that the share of the um, electricity demand um, from the wastewater treatment plant um, in comparison to the total system demand is really low. Um, I've said in the introduction that it typically, uh, typically ranges around 1% of total electricity consumption. And this is also true for our results. So um, depending on the um, en energy efficiency of the equipment, um, the energy demand of the plant varied between 0.5 to 1.3% of total system demand. Um, so when we look at the uh, effect sizes, this has to be kept in mind. As you see, the effect sizes are already really low. And then the second thing um, that I have to um, yeah, point out uh, before going into the results is that um, this optimization model, because of this, uh, like because of the way that this um, it optimization model is set up, and the way that the algorithm and the solver works, um, the model is only accurate to a certain level, and um, the optimization algorithm cri uh, stopping criterion is at uh, a 1.0 percent accuracy. So um, if we see very small effect sizes um, like 0.03%, for example, here, um, these, these very small uh, uh, changes are really difficult to interpret and can uh, yeah, often just be related to noise. So it's, it's difficult to, to interpret really small changes, particularly because the share of the wastewater treatment demand is so low. But yeah, um, having said that, We first looked into the change of unit cost of electri uh, electricity generations with like different degrees of flexibility and the unit costs of uh, electricity are the costs of electricity per generated megawatt hour so the total system costs divided by the amount of uh, generated electricity. Um, yeah, so um, as I already said, with the small effect sizes, it can be seen that the changes uh, are not yet not super meaningful when uh, only flexible duration is considered. But when the flexibility is increased, so when there's also the possibility to withhold wastewater and um, introduce flexibility to the pumping, um, these effects become more apparent. So really, um, what is already can already be seen is that um, a more or um, um, an increase in flexibility induces um, a, a bigger uh, reduction in unit costs of electricity generation. Having a closer look into the different uh, cost components, and I've split this now into the spring scenario and the autumn scenario in different. Um, in different graphs. On the left-hand side, we see the spring scenario. On the right-hand side, we see the autumn scenario. Um, and I think the most striking are the um, percentage uh, changes in startup costs, so startup costs of uh, thermal electricity generation. 
this is the most striking, but it also has to be emphasized that the startup costs only make up um, about 2% of total system costs. So their effect actually on, on the change of total system costs is not that big. And um, for example, fuel costs um, in, in darker green are a much yeah, are driving the results or the, the changes of system costs much more. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, um, the, the kind of the pattern that we've seen before in for the unit electricity, uh, for the unit electricity costs also become apparent for the total system costs. So more flexibility induces a more meaningful reduction in um, total system costs. Um, but there might be a seasonal effect at play for, um, for startup costs because we see a decrease um, in spring of startup costs, but an increase in autumn. So that suggests that there's a relationship between the system demand, the availability of, um, of, of wind on solar and uh, the wastewater inflow that, uh, that comes into the plant. Um, we also looked into the changes um, to consumer costs um, and just to make sure that these uh, consumer cost changes uh, are not necessarily driven by um, a reduction in, um, in demand. Uh, we've also compared the, the load change because we needed to estimate the total demand um, or in, in, the, in the wastewater treatment scenarios uh, based on this baseline consumption of the wastewater treatment scenario, which is not that accurate. But you can see that the load differences are actually not that meaningful. I mean, they're mostly zero. Um, so all the changes in consumer costs that you see uh, are unlikely to be driven by um, a change in, um, in uh, total system demand. Um, so um, there are, in general, you can again see that consumer costs uh, in dark green and in dark blue decrease in most scenarios. So the flexibility um, of the of the wastewater treatment plant induces um, lower consumer costs for regular consumers, but also for the wastewater treatment plant um, operator. Um, and here, for example, this this effect is the strongest in uh, in spring. Uh, we have two scenarios where we have a slight increase in price. Again, I don't want to overemphasize those because they are small changes. Um, and uh, part of that could be related to noise. But again, in those two scenarios, we see a slight increase in average prices. So this might be driven um, by, by, by those marginal effects. Although I also have to highlight that the, um, the marginal or the system prices or marginal costs that we see in, in the um, form or the type of energy models that I, I was using here um, cannot be directly directly interpreted as system prices, but can be kind of an approximation. But yeah, this is the reason why we see an increase in only those two scenarios. Um, but the general direction is that it also decreases consumer costs. Um, yeah, then we also looked at the environmental effects of, um, of the uh, flexibility of the wastewater treatment plant. And um, again, the, um, the res E share increases in most of the flexible scenarios, and again, increases more when the, um, when the wastewater treatment plant is more flexible in their demand. So the more flexible scenarios with uh, flexible pumping introduce also a higher additional um, share of res E into the system. Um, in these scenarios here, the, um, the additional um, renewable energy uh, generation comes mainly from wind energy, although we didn't give a merit order to the model, so it, um, it does, doesn't have a hierarchy in which um, it, it curtails or uses renewable energy. And I guess just because wind is the most abundant to the system, uh, this is what the system is uh, using. Um, there's also like, um, these two very small changes in spring, they are within this uh, accuracy um, criterion of the optimization. So I wouldn't over emphasize, over interpret those, those two results in spring as well. 
Um, and finally, I've also calculated the emission intensity or the change of emis emission intensity um, in those four scenarios compared to the base scenario. So the emission intensity per megawatt hour of electricity is the, the total emissions of the uh, domestically generated electricity related to the total amount of electricity that is produced. Um, and yeah, this kind of mirrors the effects that can also be seen in the res E shares. Finally, looking into the, um, the changes in wastewater treatment um, plant electricity costs. So um, the uh, cost changes um, in the flexible aeration scenarios are actually not that meaningful because we, we, we related them to uh, a time invariant baseline reference consumption. Um, where the electricity consumption profile is just flat. And this wouldn't really happen, I guess, to in a, in a real plant. But nevertheless, the comparison between the less flexible scenario and the more flexible scenario is meaningful. And here it really shows that more flexibility pays off. So um, having a more flexible, um, or, yeah, making use of more demand flexibility by withholding wastewater and uh, using the pumps in an intermittent way and additionally operating the aeration in, an, uh, in a flexible manner um, gives more cost savings also to the wastewater treatment plant operator in terms of electricity costs. Just a brief uh, summary of those results of the first case study. So um, what we're interested in were First of all, of course, the, uh, the power system costs or the, the system costs of, um, of electricity generation, but also the electricity costs to wastewater treatment plant operators and the consumers, um, and also the environmental effects. And we uh, measured that with the emission intensity um, of, the, of the generation. We can see that in most scenarios, um, these effects are um, well. The, the, um, the costs and the emission intensity um, decrease, which is a good, uh, a good thing. Um, and there are a few outlier um, scenarios where for some indicators, uh, we have a slight increase. Um, but again, as I've already described, these effect sizes are in general small. Um, and um, in parts, they can actually be interpreted, uh, cannot be meaningfully interpreted and um, yeah, just noise. Okay, now moving on to the second case study. So here we um, looked into combining the on-site electricity generation possibility from biogas with this um, yeah, demand flexibility that um, was already present in the in the previous case study. So therefore, we adapted the um, the model that we were using slightly. So kind of the left hand of the model setup of the white box approach you have already seen. But now we also added um, um, an anaerobic digester in the end of the process where part of the um, sludge is um, treated to, um, to, to, to biogas. And uh, this biogas can then be stored in, in a biogas storage. Um, and where from like the flexibility here arises again from the flexibility in pumping and aeration, but then additionally also in uh, withhold or storing biogas. And then the model has the option to pass on this biogas to an on-site CHP plant where um, the biogas can be, um, can be transformed into electricity or can be treated to, um, to generate electricity and then provide that back to the power system. Um, we have chosen an, an efficiency of the CHP of uh, 38%. Um, and this can vary depending on the, on the technical uh, characteristics of the CHB. The scenarios that we now looked into um, where the kind of the degree of flexibility and um, here I just need to clarify that we also look into the two options of having the aeration in, or operating the aeration in a flexible manner. And then in a second set of scenarios, operating the aeration 
additionally to the pumping in a flexible manner. And we call them here no flex and flex scenario, just because in the first case study, it kind of has become apparent that due to our model setup, um, the aeration actually didn't induce that much flexibility compared to the pumping, as you have seen. Um, so um, yeah, so the, the aeration and pumping flexible scenarios is, is considered the more flexible scenario. Um, and then we combine that with different options to either produce biogas, where this whole biogas module that I've introduced now is, uh, is used, or where biogas production is, uh, is not possible. So in total, we have, we have four scenarios here um, additionally um, to, to look into. Okay, so first looking into the generation of biogas. Um, so uh, in the first graph, you can see the biogas generation with and without demand response or with or without flexibility in pumping. Um, and here it becomes apparent that the flexibility in pumping or the flexibility in demand decreases biogas production. And that is because the intermittent pumping also changes the aeration requirements in the tank, and that reduces the biomass population in the tank, and that in turn reduces um, the biogas generation or the biogas potential. Um, so there already seems to be a trade-off between demand flexibility and supply flexibility or energy supply flexibility. Um, I've also shown that here in the, uh, in the second graph, which gives you the cumulative electricity generation from biogas. And you can see that over the two weeks simulation period, the, um, the amount of biogas produced in the flexible scenario is lower than um, if there's no flexibility. The environmental effects here are comparable to the first case study. Um, so all of these effects now are compared to kind of the base scenario of no flexibility and pumping and no biogas production. So you can see that the variations here come into either um, having biogas but no demand flexibility the other way around or having the two um, combined. Um, and with more electricity um, generation from biogas, um, we integrate higher shares of uh, RES-E and again, particularly wind energy into the system. Um, and it kind of seems in this particular case that the electricity that's sourced from the biogas replaces natural gas um, generation um, in particularly the biogas scenarios. Again, in the middle scenario, the change is really small and um, maybe not meaningful to interpret. Um, again, the um, emission intensity um, is uh, uh, decreases in all scenarios. Um, so this has a positive effect on the emission intensity. And then again, uh, the very small, the directions are mirrored from left to right. Um, and the very small changes um, are maybe just not that meaningful. Um, also here we have a, uh, we have a decrease in uh, total system costs um, and here um, compared to the no flexibility and no biogas scenario, uh, we have a decrease in, uh, in all system cost components, uh, particularly in startup costs, but also in emission costs and in fuel costs, and that results in, um, in uh, as a total system cost reduction in all three scenarios. Um, and the highest system cost reduction actually appears when we combine demand response um, with on-site electricity generation from biogas. So this kind of goes from left to right with the starkest reduction um, in the most flexible scenario. Now, when we contrast that with consumer costs, so I just want to show that on left hand side, you also have the change in electricity consumption and there the trend also is kind of a little bit mirrored with the with what I've shown for for the system costs. So we have the highest electricity consumption when there's no flexibility and no biogas generation, and then we have a stark reduction in net electricity consumption, which is the 
electricity consumption minus the electricity generation that the, that the plant produces when it, um, it produces electricity from biogas in the uh, case where flexibility in demand and biogas production is combined. So the combination of the two can actually lead to a 50 to, uh, to up to 50 percent decrease in, uh, in net uh, net generation and net consumption for the wastewater treatment plant operator. But um, we have seen, particularly in our um, model, that um, the uh, electricity costs for wastewater treatment plant operators and consumers um, starkly increase um, in, um, in this most flexible scenario. So I've highlighted this here in the, in the table. So um, in the most flexible scenario, we actually have an increase in uh, net expenditures by 20% for the wastewater treatment plant operator and even by 92% for consumers. And I mean, this is a model outcome. I don't want to overemphasize these implications for the real world. Nevertheless, these um, these, these high effects or these high increases in, um, in uh, electricity costs stem from very high price spikes in this particular scenario. So if you look in the first row um, into the average power system prices that we calculated for or that, that were outcome of the, of the model, um, you can see that there's a stark increase in this uh, average power system price in the uh, most flexible scenario. And this stems from uh, very few or very, um, yeah, it's only a few um, uh, periods where um, prices spike extremely to an extremely high level. And this is caused because uh, this is a direct result of the hard constraints that we put on the biogas production in form of the effluent constraints on the, um, on the biomass that can be effluented. So the combination of these hard constraints that we impose on the effluent standards, um, which are then um, a constraint for the biogas production and the flexibility in the demand so that the model can choose or can, can um, uh, optimize the electricity consumption of the plant. This uh, combination can actually lead to unintended effects when providing demand and supply flexibility at the same time. Um, and this is a, um, a very interesting outcome of this particular model, because this only becomes visible when, when the um, process constraints um, of the wastewater treatment um, process are accounted for. And in a black box model, as it is um, traditionally done, this, this wouldn't be visible. So, and um, even though the demand of the wastewater treatment plant is quite small. These effects can be quite big. And this is another outcome uh, that we've seen here. OK, um, what are the policy implications that we can draw um, from, from these two case studies? So in the first case study, I mean, we have seen that um, there um, are um, benefits to uh, the flexibility or the demand flexibility of wastewater treatment um, plants from from all uh, for all players. So um, there's not necessarily a need for policy interventions regarding the provision of demand response from wastewater treatment plants. And we really want to make an argument that there is an economic incentive for plant operators. Um, despite their, um, their constraints on their, um, on their process. And there's also um, an argument from a system perspective. So there's a benefit for consumers, for the power system, and for the wastewater treatment plant operators. And in the second case study, we have seen though that um, particularly the combination of, um, of demand and supply flexibility can lead to unintended uh, effects. And uh, therefore, um, here, there could be um, a, a case for policy support for combining the demand response um, from, from wastewater treatment plants with biogas production, just to make sure 
that um, these effects don't, uh, don't occur. Um, but instead of, for example, priority dispatch of the CHP and just like providing um, priority dispatch to, to this kind of on-site electricity generation, there should be kind of these evidence-based uh, uh, demand response schemes, which take into account particularly this interplay between electricity demand flexibility and uh, electricity supply flexibility. Okay. Um, so our conclusions are, first of all, we have uh, introduced a novel integrated energy water systems model that accounts for these, um, these process constraints of the wastewater treatment plant in a much more detailed way than it was traditionally done, and therefore informs us much more detailed about the true potential um, that the demand flexibility from wastewater treatment plants can have. Um, our first case study has shown that um, demand response from wastewater treatment plants is beneficial for the power system. So it reduces total system costs. It increases the share of renewable energies in most scenarios. Um, and also the uh, electricity costs of consumers and wastewater treatment plant operators decrease in most scenarios. Um, however, coupling um, demand response and uh, biogas generation that also reduces power system costs, but requires adequate policy design in order to, um, to prevent uh, these um, yeah, unintended price spikes um, that we have seen uh, in the most flexible scenarios. And really the main takeaway of this uh, project is the importance of including the process related constraints of the wastewater treatment process into the DR modeling, because otherwise um, some in the or unintended effects of, uh, of different strategies could be obscured in a black box model that uh, we have now uncovered in this white box approach. As a little outlook, what could be done with this project in the future, I mean, um, there are certain limitations to the model that we've used. So for example, I've not gone into too much technical detail, but a big part of, um, of this PhD project was the development of the linearized uh, reduced order biochemical model. And this model could also be extended to, um, to include other uh, processes, um, to include uh, different, um, like more variety in the inflow. So for now, for example, we've only looked into a dry weather inflow, but it would also be interesting to see um, how wet or storm weather events would, uh, uh, would affect the, um, uh, the model. Um, and uh, in terms of the energy system model, this is a pure dispatch model. So we could only look at um, the decisions um, of the of the capacity dispatch for um, for um, already taken investments into the model, so there's no additional in, um, investment perspective included in the model. Um, but there's also this interesting question whether demand response can actually defer capacity investments, and that would be really interesting to investigate in the future with a um, suitable capacity planning model. Um, then we didn't uh, include any uncertainty in our model. So our model is a perfect foresight model, but in reality, particularly regarding the wastewater influence level, but also regarding the, um, the renewable energy generation, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in, real, in the real world. So that would be interesting to also integrate that into a more stochastic model um, with, a, with a forecast tree. And finally, um, as I've already said, we've uh, worked with benchmark data, particularly on the wastewater treatment side, um, and uh, it would be um, good in the future or in, interesting in the future to replace this benchmark data for the wastewater inflow um, with real um, inflows for the wastewater, for, from the Irish wastewater treatment sector. And then together with more information on the plant layout and equipment, uh, we could also include um, transmission constraints in the power system, and then we would have a more uh, regional despair, uh, despair, 
a regionally um, diverse model. Um, and then we could also explore the role of demand response from, uh, from wastewater treatment plants in reducing regional bottlenecks of um, and uh, re re renewable energy containment in Ireland. Um, yeah, so those are um, my final words, I think. I thank you so much for your attention and I'm very look, much looking forward to all of your questions.